It's nine o'clock. I'm Yalda Hakim. This is a Sky News special program live from Jerusalem on the most significant day of the war between Israel and Hamas, a day when hostages and prisoners have been freed and a fragile ceasefire still holds. Tonight, 24 hostages released by Hamas are now back in Israel. In the past few minutes, some have arrived at a hospital for treatment. Earlier, there were cheers from Palestinians as Israeli hostages were driven away from Gaza. Among those freed are 13 women and children. Later this hour, we'll speak to a relative who's seen three members of his family released today. In exchange, 39 Palestinian women and children are being released from Israeli jails. Meanwhile, despite the ceasefire, Palestinians came under fire as they walked back towards northern Gaza to reach stranded family and friends. Good evening from Jerusalem on what has been the most significant day of this conflict since Hamas attacked Israel on October the 7th. 24 hostages held in Gaza have been released, among them 13 Israeli women and children reunited with their families and loved ones tonight. The others include 10 Thai nationals and one Filipina citizen. It marks the end of almost seven weeks in captivity and is part of a deal that has seen Israel agree to release 39 Palestinian prisoners and observe a four-day ceasefire. Our first uh, report comes from our uh, Middle East correspondent, Alistair Blunkel. As the hostages left Khan Yunus in Gaza in the care of the International Red Cross, they were cheered by Palestinians at the side of the road. Two peoples at war, but the relief of a ceasefire at last, evident on both sides. After 48 days in captivity, the hostages crossed from Gaza into Egypt and freedom. Among them, 13 Israelis, 10 Thai nationals and a Filipino. From there, as they changed buses, the world got the first glimpse of the small children with their mothers and the elderly women who were taken seven weeks ago and had not been heard from since. From the Rafa border, they were driven the short distance to Israel, through the fence, back onto home soil, and into the hands of the Israeli military. Among the 13 Israelis released were nine-year-old Ohad Munda, his mother Karen, and grandmother Ruth. Her husband is still thought to be in Gaza. Danielle Aloni and her six-year-old daughter were also amongst the freed. So too, mother Doran Asher with her two young daughters, Aviv and Raz. And 85-year-old Yafa Ada, who was paraded into Gaza on a golf buggy seven weeks ago. 77-year-old Hannah Katzir was proclaimed dead by Palestinian Islamic Jihad only a few days ago. But today, she was released from Gaza alive. In central Tel Aviv, the Museum Plaza, which has now become a somber vigil for the missing, was filled with the music of hope. After seven exhausting weeks of desperation, they danced as the news came through. This is a moment of hope and joy for Israelis, but hope in the context and knowledge that many still remain hostage inside Gaza. Not until all the hostages are released will Israel really celebrate. Until then, there are many families still waiting for their own Freedom Day. There are a lot of more than 200 uh, out there that we don't know whether they are alive or not. And uh, the, the continuing nerve-wracking situation is, of course, uh, keeping being continued. On board the Israeli military helicopters waiting to fly the hostages to hospital were children's ear defenders, and mobile phones for the hostages to immediately call relatives. The Israeli authorities have been preparing for this moment for weeks. 
Many of the hostages will come out with no idea what has happened. Family homes have been destroyed and children will be told that they are now orphans. Life as they knew it will never be the same again. There's a protocol on how to approach them, how to speak with them, what information to give them, which questions to answer and which questions are better off to be unanswered at this stage by this soldier. Tonight, the hostages are being cared for in hospitals across Israel. They will stay there for as long as they need to. Tomorrow, it is expected that more will be released. Israel is finally starting to get its people home. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News in Tel Aviv. Well, uh, in a moment, we'll speak to someone who had three family members released today uh, from three different generations. Uh, but uh, they, uh, they were seen in this footage uh, released from Hamas showing members of the Munda family being transferred from the militant group to the Red Cross as part of the truce deal today. Nine-year-old Ohad, his mother Karen and her mother Ruthie, who is 78. Well, I'm joined now uh, by Ite Raviv, who is Ruthie Munda's uh, nephew. Thank you so much, Ite, for joining us here on the programme. What an emotionally charged day. I mean, just seeing that a Red Cross convoy come out of Gaza into Egypt uh, and then to see them go through that medical uh, screening at that centre at the Rafa uh, crossing. I mean, it has been such an extremely emotional day. Yeah, it has been. Uh, we received the news yesterday uh, when Israel's received the list uh, of the people that are supposed to be released. Uh, we didn't believe it until we saw uh, those ambulances of the Red Cross, uh, until we saw them in Israel, uh, because there has been talks, there has been delays. Um, yeah, it's very emotional. We were very happy that they're here. Uh, but we need to remember that uh, my uncle Abraham, Wouti's husband, is still not here, is still uh, in the hands of Hamas. We don't know what his condition is. The Red Cross has not visited any of the hostages. Uh, he's an old person, he's 78 years old, he works with a cane, he needs to take medicines daily. We don't know even if he was with the three that were released. And we need to remember that he's still there and there are 200 more hostages still held by Hamas. And we are happy, but it's not, it's not over yet, it's, it's just the beginning. Indeed. And have you had a chance to speak to any of your family members or get news about uh, how they're feeling, how they're doing now? Not yet. As you reported, right now they're getting into uh, the hospital where they'll be meeting with uh, a few family members, uh, Karen's partner, Dohan's dad, and Ruti's sisters. Um, so I will be speaking to them afterwards. I'll see how they're doing. Uh, in this video, they look quite scared, uh, but I hope now that they're back home, uh, they'll start getting more relaxed. I don't know what's going on in the mind of a, of a nine-year-old who spent his ninth birthday in captivity, and he's been there for 50 days. I don't know what's going on in his head. Um, and uh, I hope that they can be slowly, gradually going back to reality, this horrific reality. Uh, another family member, uh, they don't know it yet. He was murdered. With his son, Karen's sister, is also his uncle. Um, he was murdered on October 7th. I don't know if they know it. Uh, they're, going, they're probably going to hear the news now. So it's just another glimpse of the horrific reality that we're living at the moment. Yes, uh, we were told about the way in which uh, the IDF have been trained uh, to handle them, to, to uh, not to embrace them or hold them without permission, uh, and then mm -hmm. to be able to bring them safely to the medical facilities where they will go uh, undergo not just medical treatment, but also psychological treatment. Yeah, I think it's important. Again, a lot of these only nine, and there are over 30 kids still held in captivity. Uh, not one Western country in the world had to deal with this situation before. Uh, we're the first ones to deal with this horrible situation. And hopefully uh, Israel's best therapists uh, will be able to assist them uh, because we don't know what they've been through. We saw what Hamas is capable on October 7th. We saw how they butchered people, raped, uh, kidnapped. We don't know what conditions they were held in, in Gaza. We don't know 
what is the condition of the rest of the hostages. And we really need all of them back home as soon as possible to make sure they're safe. I mean, you can see the photos of my family now, and you saw the video of their release today. It doesn't look like it's the same people. So I'm pretty sure they didn't have such a, they didn't have a good time in, in Gaza, in captivity. And this is why, and I want to emphasize that we need to bring everyone back home as soon as possible, and we need to keep bringing the hostages back. One thing uh, that has become clear, obviously, Israel is a very small uh, country. It seems everyone knows someone uh, who was either taken or impacted by this. And certainly the families of the hostages have come together and become their own small community over the past seven weeks. Yeah, it's true. Uh, first, all Israelis do know someone who was impacted uh, by this. I've been getting so many messages today since the news uh, came. And uh, yeah, you're right about the, the families of the hostages. We have become one big family. And I really look forward to seeing other people return because I know their families. I feel like I'm, I am part of their family now. And it, unfortunately, when we heard the news of uh, hostages being killed in captivity, I was sad like it was my family member. Um, I think it's something unique about Israelis and about our situation. We all feel for one another and we feel like a, one big family. And everyone was so happy today to see uh, the Israelis, that the hostages come back home. Again, these are innocent people. These are kids. Uh, we look forward for the next few days to see more kids come back home, including babies, toddlers, and just young children who shouldn't be even one day in captivity. And unfortunately, they had to suffer this hell for over 30, 50 days now. Ite, uh, we wish you and your family well. And as you say, there are so many other anxious uh, families uh, waiting uh, for their family members to be released from captivity over the next uh, four or five days. Thank you so much uh, for joining Thank us you. here on the program. Now, there were clashes in the West Bank as thousands of Palestinians waited uh, to see the release of their prisoners in exchange for the hostages captured in Israel. Well, let's speak now to our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, who was there. And, uh, Dominic, I mean, we've been talking all day. Uh, you were wearing a gas mask at one point because of the tear gas. Just tell us what was going on. Well, it got pretty chaotic. It began in a sort of a mood of anticipation, sort of in, in the sunshine. We had families coming out waving flags. Uh, waiting expectantly for the uh, prisoners to be released. And then the Israelis moved in pretty assertively and those same families ran away, their, their daughters um, crying, uh, and the mood really soured. And it really soured most of all when um, a small group of Palestinian youths moved in waving Hamas flags and the Israelis didn't like that and they fired a lot of tear gas in. And the tear gas kept on coming, basically. And what they were trying to do was clear the area, I think, but also they didn't like the look of those green uh, Hamas uh, flags. Um, and I think the the, the sort of the takeaway from the day is that the Israelis try to control the script. They, they did say to the families, any kind of celebration, any kind of giving out of sweets, any kind of party is going to be punished. You're going to be fined 70,000 shekels. That's a lot of money. Um, and they tried to control the script. And the prisoners being released and also the families have totally defied that. And the lasting image of this day is going to be a green Hamas flags waving over this coach of prisoners being released. And, of course, Hamas are going to take can credit for all that. And um, this is my report from the day. Israel delivered its side of the bargain after a barrage of tear gas. Then the coach appeared. On board, the released Palestinian prisoners reveling in their liberation, welcomed in ecstatic scenes by the West Bank crowd. How do you feel? I feel fantastic. Why? It's a, it's a winning win. If we die, it's Shahada, and if we live, this is going to happen. Israeli occupation authorities had banned any celebration of the homecoming, but that was comprehensively ignored. The euphoria could not be suppressed. This is the moment they've been waiting for, their women and children released from Israeli jails back into the West Bank. To Israelis, the people on board are terrorists. To these people, they are heroes of their resistance against Israel's occupation. Hamas will claim this as a victory. Their green flags waved over the crowd. Despite Israel's best efforts, this will only make Hamas stronger on the West Bank.
The prisoners defied Israeli orders not to talk to the cameras. Hanan Barghouti had been in jail for two months without trial and had this message for her captors. We are the owner of this land. They are the terrorists. They are the ones who took our land. They are persecuting us, and that's how they create resistance inside us. Our small children, when they grow up, they will become resistance. Even the unborn children would become Hamas, whether Israel likes it or not. There'd been a tense build-up all day. Israelis moving in to clear the area, terrifying some in the crowds. Right, get in the vehicle. As darkness fell, there were clashes between Palestinians and Israelis and a number of casualties. But this is what Palestinians will remember from this evening, scenes that may be repeated now in coming nights. Their brothers and sisters released into freedom and Hamas taking the credit. So I think the point to make here is, is that a lot of people have said that this uh, campaign that Israel is waging in Gaza, it can't just be a military campaign. There has to be a political solution to this, which is hard to imagine at the moment in, in the thick of war. But uh, ultimately, there has to be a political solution. And that solution is going to get further and further away if Hamas gets more and more control of the West Bank. For those who are not entirely familiar with the geography, Hamas, the more extremist part of the Palestinian society, controls Gaza, carried out these attacks and is now being punished for that by Israel. The Palestinian Authority, Fatah, the more moderate faction controls, nominally controls the West Bank. They believe in a two-state solution. Hamas does not. What we're going to see, what we've seen today, what we're going to see over the coming days is Hamas taking uh, credit for this, claiming that they were behind this prisoner release, being hailed as heroes by many in the West Bank, and that is not going to help any kind of political solution. Tom, thank you so much for your reporting, and we will be talking to you a little later in the programme. Now, even after the ceasefire was supposed to have taken effect, Palestinians still came under fire today in Gaza. Aid is badly needed inside the territory after weeks of bombardment by Israeli forces. Our special correspondent Alex Crawford has more on the situation facing Palestinians as they get a few days of respite. And we should warn you, uh, her report does contain some distressing images. <laughs> As soon as the truce came into force, the trucks began rolling. This is what they've been crying out for inside Gaza. Critical aid, food, medicine and fuel finally being delivered during the agreed lull. And hundreds took to the road to try to reach stranded children, parents, friends, still trapped in the north. They hesitated at the Israeli checkpoint dividing south from north. So many have been displaced without taking anything with them. They're anxious to see if they have homes to return to. Then shots rang out. They waved white flags, but the firing went on. Witnesses told us Israeli snipers fired directly into the crowd, wounding several. The Israeli military said they'd warned the north was off limits. This was their response. More panic, more mayhem, and more blood spilled with one man appealing in Hebrew, Arabic and English for peace. Stop! Kill our children, our women, our, our youth. We are peace people. We hate the war. We want peace. We deserve to live like all the nations. The scramble to save lives and limbs in Gaza didn't stop, lull or not. Those who'd held on to life this long after nearly seven weeks of bombings must have thought they'd made it. But the fresh casualties on the day the truce kicked in now join the thousands of others struggling in a health system which has utterly collapsed. Our crew who managed to reach the now abandoned Indonesian hospital found a pitiful sight. Mattresses strewn all over the floor where dozens of wounded had taken refuge. Filthy, chaotic scenes through every corridor which speak to some of the torment these people went through before the hospital staff were forced to evacuate, taking whichever patients were strong enough to be moved. And they found multiple dead bodies. We counted at least 20 in this one spot. The center of Gaza City has been obliterated. This was once the hub of the Gaza Strip, bustling and full of people, now pitted with craters, and any building still standing is uninhabitable. 
and there are thousands of bodies still buried under rubble. But the break in the bombing is the first glimpse of hope in nearly seven weeks, and they are clinging on to that. Alex Crawford, Sky News. And uh, Alex joins us live now from Cairo. And uh, Alex, a moment of respite for the people of Gaza, although there is so much uncertainty that still remains. Yeah, a very welcome respite. It wasn't completely all over Gaza, as you saw, with our um, very brave camera crew inside the Gaza Strip managing to capture those pictures. They were right in the thick of it, talking about multiple um, gun firing going on. Uh, our cameraman himself nearly got shot. Uh, the Israeli military has said and insists that uh, the war is still ongoing and they dropped leaflets in the southern part of, of Gaza where most of uh, the civilians are now placed, warning them not to try and return to the north. Uh, they tried to because they're, they're, they've still got trapped family up there. They want to try and return to their homes. Those pictures are absolutely devastating, showing how much um, damage has been done in the north of the Gaza Strip. And, of course, in the midst of all of this, we have got thousands of injured people, literally thousands, with uh, a health system which is uh, really flattened and depleted of, of aid and medicines. The, the Israelis, as part of the deal, were promising to get in around 200 aid trucks daily. They're saying they, they managed to get those aid trucks over today. We understand that it's probably around about 137 at the last count that have reached uh, UN points within um, the city, so uh, within the Gaza Strip. So it's not, it's a fraction anyway of what they were getting before October the 7th. There were about 800 aid trucks every day. We saw what was in a number of those trucks, uh, a number of medical supplies going in. It's still pretty minimal, and given the, the, the amount of help that they need, the amount of people that are injured and wounded, and the extent of their injuries, with many of them left untreated, wounds have been left untreated for about a week, those that were trapped in Al-Shifa Hospital and the Indonesian Hospital, the doctors have got a massive challenge and as one of the, the the main directors of one of the few standing hospitals which are still functioning though triple the number of patients that they're used to dealing with uh, said to me we are drowning here and we need help and we need help now so they will be looking forward to the next three days now to try and get as much aid medicines and help in and as many sick and injured people out and we still don't really have the numbers of how many of them actually have made it out over to Egypt to better medical facilities so hopefully we'll get a bit more of those details as as the days go on. Alex uh, thank you so much for joining us and for all of your reporting. Now this is Sky News coming up we'll get reaction from uh, the United States to the release of hostages and prisoners in Gaza and Israel.
action going on. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is what makes the job so fantastic. Welcome back to this special program live from Jerusalem. Now, let's take you uh, straight to central uh, Israel now, uh, where we can show you a press conference which is about to uh, begin outside the, uh, well, this is inside the Schneider Medical Center, where we understand that four children and uh, four adults uh, have been taken for some preliminary examination. Uh, as well as uh, some, uh, they'll be meeting with some psychologists as well. And the uh, Schneider Medical uh, Facility has been prepared uh, all day for this. They've been making all sorts of preparations, putting together uh, packages for the children of toys. You can see there the uh, rubber ducks as well. Uh, so they were really waiting and anticipating uh, for this moment. But they're going to be holding a press conference as well. They have said that four children and four adults have visited the facility for those medical uh, examinations, but they're going to also update us. Uh, so as soon as that happens, we will be bringing that to you live. Let's go straight to Alistair Bunkle, uh, who joins us live now from uh, Tel Aviv. And uh, it's been such a big day uh, from the hospital, uh, I, I believe. Um, but uh, it's been such a big day, Alistair, hasn't it, uh, for these families of the hostages, but of course for the hostages themselves who are now going through such a major process going through all those medical checks. Yes, yeah, so we are at the Schneider Hospital where uh, a number of them have been brought. This is a specialist children's hospital uh, and so they've landed here in two helicopters over the, about the last half an hour or so. I think we just heard uh, one of them taking off having uh, dropped off some of the hostages. They will come here and they will start to receive some proper medical care. They've been uh, checked over having had preliminary checks both when they left Gaza into Egypt but then uh, when they were greeted by the IDF over the Israeli border, but it's once they get here that they can be properly examined. We understand they, at least the ones who have come here, are in pretty good physical order. Um, it's the mental trauma that they've been through, I think, that most people are concerned about, uh, and how long that will take, um, because we were speaking to a psychologist earlier who said it could be many, many years. We're talking about some very young children here, who themselves have seen, witnessed and uh, heard some very traumatic experiences. Uh, but also many of them, whether it's the hostages released today or if hostages are released subsequently, will be told news that will be absolutely devastating for their lives. They will be told that they uh, no longer have parents left. They'll be told that their community, their homes have been completely destroyed. And, and that will take a lot of time for them to recover from. And so they will receive very, very careful and specialist care here. 
But the Israelis admit themselves that, and as one person said to me, I quote, we are inventing the wheel. The Israelis know about trauma through war. Uh, the Israelis experience war with Hamas and others on quite a regular basis throughout their 75-year history. They have never experienced anything like this. They have never had this amount of hostages taken uh, in the history of the State of Israel, and they have never had so many children taken hostage. And so they're experiencing this for the first time as well as professionals. But they believe that they put a plan in place. They have been working on it ever since the day after the 7th of October attacks. And they now have the first release of hostages in their care, and they will do all they can to care for them. Alistair, uh, such a, a big day, as we said, uh, for those families and a long road uh, ahead uh, and many more days of this uh, over the coming uh, four or so days. Thanks so much uh, for bringing us up to date there. Now, speaking earlier this evening, President Biden said uh, that he expected more hostages to be released in the coming days. And I want to thank all three leaders for their personal partnership to get this done. I spoke with the Emir and President el-Sisi and the Prime Minister Netanyahu again on Wednesday to confirm the elements of the engagement. As I said, today's release are the start of a process. We expect more hostages to be released tomorrow and more the day after and more the day after that. Over the next few days, we expect that dozens of hostages will be returned to their families. President Joe Biden speaking a little earlier. Well, let's go uh, straight to the United States and speak to our correspondent, James Matthews, who joins us from Washington. And, and James, uh, we heard there from President Biden welcoming this, saying he's spoken to the Qataris. But, of course, there will be questions asked over the next few days uh, about whether any American uh, hostages will also be released. Hi, Yalda. Yes, uh, the American audience has been led to believe they will be amongst the first 50. Indeed, that was the clear guidance from a senior administration official. And Joe Biden touched on it. There are three, two women and a young girl by the name of Abigail Edan. Today is her fourth birthday, the youngest American hostage. The guidance was that these three would be among the first 50. When Joe Biden spoke, he said that he was awaiting the list of who will be released tomorrow. It remains to be seen whether or not they will be on that. But, of course, Iran-backed Hamas will be in no rush to please Joe Biden or do him any favours politically. There is a currency for them in retaining American hostages as this process plays out. And it's a difficulty for Joe Biden domestically he is seen to be weak on foreign policy. A poll out a few days ago showed that the majority, a large majority of Americans, don't rate his performance on the Middle East conflict thus far. And six, six weeks in, when he describes the return of American hostages as his highest priority, um, he needs to demonstrate evidence that he is a dealmaker who can deliver on his hopes, promises and expectations of the American people. In that news conference, Shalda, he did accentuate the positive, styled himself, as have his partners in this process, as the deal-maker uh, in principle. The Israelis call it a Biden deal, not a Netanyahu deal. It was Biden who was front and centre in all of this. And it's a measure of his influence uh, to, to steer his way through this labyrinth. Um, let me show you a quick piece of video. He gave that news conference at at the White Elephant Hotel in Nantucket. He's been on holiday for Thanksgiving. Let me show you a quick clip, Yalda, of what happened when he left that hotel. Come on, everybody. Keep moving. There you go. That's a measure of the frustration and the criticism Biden faces. Some in that crowd shouting, free Palestine, ceasefire. There was a feeling in the White House that he was vindicated in part because he'd struck this hostage deal. I think with the continuing absence of Americans on the list of those freed, uh, he does face questions around his strategy 
and specifically what is his strategy worth without the release of American hostages, what he calls his highest priority. James, uh, thank you so much for bringing us up to date there from Washington. This is Sky News coming up. We'll hear reaction to uh, today's uh, hostage deal from the leader of the Palestinian National Initiative. Welcome back to this special program on the day of the release of Israeli hostages and Palestinian prisoners. Let's get more on what will happen next. President Biden has said the chances of an extension to the truth are real and more hostages could be released. Well, we can speak now to Mustafa Barghouti, the General Secretary of the uh, Palestinian National Initiative, who joins us from Ramallah. Mr. Barghouti, it's always good to speak to you and see you. Thank you very much for joining us here on the program. It's been uh, a long day. We saw the ceasefire coming to effect at 7 o'clock in the morning here. And then we saw those first hostages released. And, of course, later uh, in the evening, we saw 39 Palestinian women and children being released as well. 
The thing that really stood out from today was uh, the tear gas uh, that the IDF felt they needed to use uh, because a group of Palestinian youth arrived holding and carrying Hamas flags. How much of a problem do you think that is? I think there is no problem whatsoever. The problem is on the Israeli side. Uh, people came to to welcome their uh, prisoners who were released, mostly children. All, all of them are children and women who have been uh, in Israeli jails, and uh, some for several years, and they came to welcome them. And Israel did not want to allow anybody to get close. They wanted to disperse the crowd because they said the Israelis have warned everybody that they don't want to see any uh, celebration. I'm so sorry. Um, the release. Sabah I'm, I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. Baguchi. I'm just going to have to uh, interrupt you just briefly because there's a press conference that's just, that's just begun. I'm going to keep you there uh, if you don't mind, and we're going to go straight to the Schneider Medical uh, Center where we are going to get uh, more information about the developments of the day. Let's have a listen in. Underwent physical and medical assessment that was done in a very professional and sensitive manner. It is the first time that the State of Israel needs to prepare to the return of so many hostages, which include children. As part of the preparation, we were exposed to all the medical information from previously. And we are checking for any change in their medical condition. It is a complex event for those who are returning to Israel and their families and to this entire country. Along with the excitement, we seek to keep their privacy and dignity and give them some space. The Ministry of Health will do everything it can in order to give the returning hostages full support. And we, of course, are hopeful for the return of all the hostages. Joseph Menlovic, Associate Director, Ministry of Health. An hour ago, a total of the eight released hostages arrived here at the Schneider's Children Medical Center. We have all anxiously awaited their return and are elated to see the day that they have come home to us. The Ministry of Health preparations for the hostages' return began at the start of the war and included building the medical and mental health environment that the released hostages would require upon the return home. A total of six Israeli hospitals took part in this mission and were prepared ahead of time to receive and treat the released hostages. As part of the meticulous planning the patients arrived and were admitted to the hospital discreetly, where they were reunited with their families and began to undergo a medical evaluation process conducted with the utmost sensitivity and dedication by the hospital staff. This is the first time that the State of Israel has had to prepare for the arrival of so many hostages, including young children. The preparations for their arrival, including the collection and consolidation of all available medical information about the returning hostages. However, we are receiving the released hostages today without any prior knowledge of changes in their medical condition that may have occurred since they were kidnapped. This is a complex event, both medically and emotionally, for the released hostages who have returned to Israel, for their families, for the entire people of Israel whether in Israel or abroad. Alongside our joy and the feeling that the hostages are now a part of our family, we must ensure their privacy and dignity. The Ministry of Health and all personnel of the Israeli health system are overjoyed with the return home of the hostages, and we will do everything in our power to give them the most comprehensive and precise care. And we yearn for the return home of all our Hostages. Thank you very much.
So you were listening there to the staff at the Schneider Hospital giving us a bit of an update of uh, the very latest. He said that four children and four women have been admitted to the uh, children's hospital. They said they're handling them with utmost care. Of course, they will go through various medical screenings as well as meeting with a psychologist uh, because, of course, the last uh, seven weeks has been extremely traumatic uh, for them while they've been in Gaza in Hamas captivity. Uh, so just a bit of an update there from the Schneider Hospital where eight people, four children, four women, have been taken uh, for further medical treatment and examination. And he also said that they have uh, been reunited with their family members. Let's go back to Mustafa Baghouti, who was speaking to us uh, before uh, that uh, press conference began. And Mr Baghouti, we were just talking about the 39 Palestinian women and children who have also been released today uh, as part of the deal. And in total, over the next four days, we are expecting... Uh, 150 from today until uh, the end of this truce uh, for them to be released as well? Yes, 150 out of 8,000 prisoners. Uh, 8,000, including 250 children who are kept in Israeli jails and some for several years, uh, which is totally unacceptable. If you call an Israeli child a hostage, you should call a Palestinian child a hostage as well. I'm so pleased that 50 Israeli women and children will be released. And by the way, they could have been released weeks ago if Israel just accepted a temporary ceasefire. Anyhow, now they are going to be released. I hope that all the Israeli prisoners will be released, but also all Palestinian prisoners should be released. But uh, the scenes of today were shocking in Gaza too, where the Israeli army shot, guns, uh, shot gunshots at people who were trying to go back to their homes in Gaza City, killing two people and injuring yes, and seven, seven uh, others. Yes, and uh, we showed yeah, a let report me... about uh, what happened in, in Gaza today. I, I just want to uh, have you focus on uh, after the, uh, or just before the prisoners were released, uh, we were talking about the tear gas that was used uh, and the tensions that were rising because, of course, we did hear about the a tear gas was uh, used young men not who because... arrived. The tear gas was used not because there was a couple of Hamas flags. The tear gas was used because Israel did not want Palestinians to celebrate the release of their prisoners. They've warned some of them, some of the prisoners, they warned them that if there will be any other people but their relatives welcoming them, they will take them back to jail. Israel wants to show, wants to deny the families the right even to celebrate the fact that their children are released which is very strange behavior, in my opinion. But the more important thing is that is how do we, do we get further? And the most important thing here, in my opinion, is to consolidate a, a ceasefire forever, and not just for four days, for the sake of Palestinians and Israelis, but mainly for the sake of Palestinians who have lost up till now 6,500 children and about 14,500 people killed. If they remove the bodies from under Mr. the rubble, and, and, and if the estimates are correct, we will be talking about 9,000 Palestinian children killed. Nothing in the world can justify this atrocity. And, and we've been covering uh, this over the last seven weeks, uh, the events in Gaza, the tragedy and the pain yes, of you, the Gazan people you, uh, throughout you, this. You, you get nervous each time I speak about Palestinian suffering. You shouldn't. Because Palestinians are equal human. Uh, well, no, we absolutely, we absolutely don't get nervous. We, we show it each night on our screens to our audiences. Very we good. absolutely good are not nervous about uh, Palestinian uh, suffering. Palestinian suffering is real. Uh, but I also want to talk to you about the sensitivity of the moment when uh, we, you understand the sensitivity of what's happening right now and, and a group of youth hold up a Hamas flag that does create this the environment that's already thing, really? very tense. Is that it, the most it, it important thing? It isn't, but it also did escalate the, the situation. It is important for you, but today. not for the public. No, you should talk about the fact that there are 8,000 Palestinian prisoners in jail. You should talk about the fact that Isra Ja'abis will be released. Her body is completely burned. She's been suffering from pain for nine years. 
and the Israelis would not release her. You should talk, be speaking about Walid Abduqa, who is half suffering from cancer and who spent 25 years in jail. He finished his term, but they still keep him in jail. You should speak about the fact that during last night, the Israeli army arrested more people than the ones uh, that uh, are uh, released. Uh, uh, and Mr. Baguti, that's why we talk to you, so that you can talk about these issues. But if I can just keep you there again, uh, so sorry, we're going to go back to this press conference at the Schneider Hospital. Let's have a listen in. Teams in a compound that we had prepared for them, which is private. The Balinson Hospital team is assisting us a lot in taking care of the women and the elderly, and we truly ask and are very strict about maintaining their privacy. I cannot even describe to you how moving and what emotions there were during these moments with the families. We are doing everything in order to take care of the physical, mental, psychological health of all those who have returned to Israel and have come to the Schneider Hospital. We believe that it is a national mission and it is a great privilege for us and we're thankful for the fact that we were given this privilege. Of course, our hearts goes to the hostages who are still in Gaza and their families and we truly hope that they will return to us very soon, healthy and taken care of. About half an hour ago, I was thrilled to be the one to receive four children, three mothers and a grandmother to the best and most caring hands here at Schneider Children's Medical Center of Israel. Their physical condition is good, and they're currently undergoing medical and emotional assessment by the medical and psychological team here at Schneider's. We designated a special area that is very private, and there is also a team from our neighbor, Bailinson Hospital, that is assisting us in taking care of the women. We kindly request that all of us, and especially you, respect their privacy. There are not enough words to express the emotion that we are feeling at this time, together with the families and the entire nation of Israel. We will do our utmost to care for the physical and emotional health of the returned hostages. From our perspective, this is a national mission, and we are just extremely proud to have the privilege to treat them. Our hearts are with the other captives who are still in Gaza. We are with their families, and we hope that they will turn as soon as possible. We hope that they return in a whole and healthy way in the very near future. Thank you very much and good night. You were listening to Dr. Efrat Bron Havel, the CEO of the Schneider Children's Hospital, giving a bit of an update to the press there about the hostages. Uh, they say that they are in good physical condition. We understand that four children and four women have been admitted into the hospital. So we were getting a bit of an update. We've got Dom here with us uh, to really just summarise the events uh, of today because it has been a long day. Ceasefire that's held, uh, the hostages released, Palestinian prisoners uh, released. And, and really, this is only day one. It, is, and it has been an extraordinary day. Both I mean, the pictures we've seen in Gaza, Tel Aviv, the West Bank have been extraordinary. I think it's worth sort of taking stock. You know, um, seven weeks ago, tomorrow morning, Israel suffered uh, an attack on the scale and savage barbarity of which we hadn't seen before. And no, no other countries really suffered the kind of attack that was launched by Hamas on October the 7th. And there was talk of a new paradigm. Maybe Hamas was launching a new, entirely new kind of jihad that Hezbollah was just waiting in the wings for Israel to get bogged down in Gaza to follow 
in on, that Iran would get involved as well. And as it's turned out, that hasn't happened. Um, it could happen by accident, but it hasn't happened by design. Uh, and also Hamas has turned out willing to negotiate and, and negotiate on kind of terms that actually quite old paradigm, which is to have a ceasefire, to let aid in and to discuss hostages. Obviously, we've never seen the numbers like we have now, but it's kind of on the lines that we've seen before. So that's reassuring. It, it has uh, eased, obviously, the tension. It, it has offered a way out of this conflict, only temporary for now. But I think there are two causes for concern. One is the fact that um, these green flags of Hamas have, have, have waved over okay. uh, the situation in, in, on the West Bank, but also the fact that in a few days Israel may well go back, has said it's going to go back and launch, relaunch its offensive in Gaza. Dom, thank you so much uh, for that update. Uh, well, a big day, as Dominique was saying there. Uh, lots of moving parts, and this is just the beginning. There are at least three more days. If this uh, truce does hold, we will be watching all of these uh, developments very closely here on Sky News. Thank you so much for watching.